and welcome to all of you here. Uh, a shout out to all of our sites, wherever you are. Uh, we appreciate you and we, uh, we're uh, all in this together. If you're watching online, you are also part of us, wherever you are in the, in the city, country, world, wherever you are, man. It's good to have you. Hey, before I get to the message, let me, um, let me share just a few pastoral thoughts with you. Uh, I do this every now and then we kind of have a family moment. And you know, it's interesting as a church, uh, we have declared a mission. Uh, we, we are not just doing church, we're doing church on purpose. And it's to, we're leading people to discover who Jesus is and then to fully own their faith in him. And we've been about that for literally decades, but just kind of watching what's happening in our church. I, I am experiencing, honestly, I think the greatest year of my life in ministry. Uh, and in huge part, it's because of this transition that's taken place, um, which has allowed us to bring Sean on our staff. And what's been so wonderful to watch is in the last, and I'm about five and a half months from, I'm going to hand this over to him. Uh, he will take the helm of our church. And for the last six and a half months, you've had a chance to get to know him. And it has been just universal, man, from the board to the staff, to the people I've talked to in our congregation, man. Uh, everyone is now coming up to me and going, we get it. We totally get it why you are so excited. And so I am just so excited about our church. I feel like we are in fantastic hands and uh, it is making life absolutely wonderful. So with all of that said, I wanna just tell you something. I wanna tell everyone I know about our church. I'm biased as I can be. I don't hide that. I just wanna get the word out. And if you are anything like me, if you, if, if you're watching what's going on here, I wanna just encourage you to tell people. And the reason for that is because, you know what? We, we tell people things that, you go to a movie, you go to a restaurant, you discover something, we tell people. And uh, we have Thanksgiving coming up and we have Christmas coming up. There are so many people that would love an invite from you. Uh, our Thanksgiving Eve service, by the way, we do this on all of our campuses. Thousands of people show up the night before Thanksgiving. It's a tradition. And uh, it's incredible. Invite somebody to come with you. A and then uh, on all of our Christmas weekends and then Christmas Eve services that we're gonna have multiple nights, man, I just encourage you, don't, don't come alone. And you know something else uh, you can do? If you just wanna tell people what you feel, ah, I don't feel like, I, I don't know how to start that conversation. I, I don't know if you have seen these, my guess is you have, but um, these are these window clings, which this is what they actually look like before you put them on your car. And um, I have these on my car and I get in all kinds of conversations with people. Uh, they'll come up and they'll either ask me or they'll, like mine also says made for more. And they'll go, what in the world is made for more mean? And I get a chance to explain. If you want to put one of these on your car, I want you to understand they're right outside. They'll be on all of our campuses in the lobby. On most campuses, there's also going to be somebody who will help put it on your car this very day if, uh, if you want that. Uh, makes a difference. One last thing I want to just tell you. There's so many things to talk about. This coming Friday night on all of our campuses, men, we're going to get together and have a barbecue. And uh, I invite you, I encourage you to come. Bring somebody with you. It's a man night. It's a, a night for guys to be together and just kind of hang out. And so all of that stuff's happening and it's going to be fun. So I want you to be a part of it. Now, let's get to the message. Um, last week, we wrapped up a series, a six-week series that we were doing on mental health. And I mean to tell you, it was called The Battle Within. And uh, it, with that thing, uh, I mean, you talk about hitting the mark. There were so many people's comments and testimonials. Uh, I, I got emails from people, just people just saying, man, thank you. Uh, one of the premises of that whole series was everybody struggles with something. And, and, and uh, I, the way I put it is everybody has an it. That's it uh, is for you. And what was so good about that series is when we talked about everybody having an it, everyone then feels a little bit self, less self-conscious about, I got an issue. And you start to realize we all got issues and we're all in this together, we're struggling together. And one of the things that we said throughout that series was, uh, it's okay to not be okay. So often when we come to church, we feel like we have to put on some facade. We gotta look good, we gotta put on the image. And we come and we slap a smile on and, and the truth is you're not doing that well. It's okay to not be okay. But it's not okay to continue to not be okay when there are so many resources available. And so we talked about that and a lot of you got involved in ways you hadn't before and that was just really cool. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna start a two week series and it's gonna be on mental health. And I'm, I didn't just misstate that and you didn't just mishear it. We're gonna do a two week series on mental health and uh, it's not gonna be the same. 
If that last one was called the, the battle within, I'm going to call this one the battle without. Well, what are you talking about, Pastor? I want to talk about the fact that so there's sometimes there's internal issues that really mess us up. And that's what we talked about in that first series. This is the external issues that really mess us up. And, and, and what I want to, I want to talk about something uh, in the next two weeks that I, I just need you to understand. The issue that we're going to talk about has destroyed friendships. The issues we're going to talk about have destroyed marriages. They have destroyed business partnerships. The issues we're going to talk about have destroyed families. And uh, it, it's time to talk about it. I'm going to talk today and next week about the intersection of faith and politics. And all of a sudden, the air went out of the room. There we go, right there. Uh, you might be going, faith and politics, are you kidding? Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about this. Um, you, and you might be going, what, is, what in the world does politics have to do with mental health? Well, if, it's interesting, uh, uh, American Psychology, um, the Psychological Association just did a survey. This is what they found. Seven out of 10 Americans, just under seven, said that the 2024 election was a significant source of stress in their life. So if you're like uptight about this coming election, you are absolutely where most people are. And uh, if it's affecting you at all, uh, you're exactly where most people are. I think that there's two things, two emotions that this election, uh, most elections of surface in us, and um, I'll, let me just identify them. Emotion number one is anxiety. Anxiety. What is gonna happen to us if, and then you finish that sentence however you wanna finish it. Anxiety is a debilitating fear of the unknown. And uh, we have all kinds of scenarios run through our heads. What, what are we gonna do? And so anxiety, the other one is anger, anger. And there is all kinds of anger being expressed right now. Anger that is about, man, about people and politics and platforms and parties and all that kind of stuff. Um, very uh, possibly, very likely, I might wanna say, the worst anger that we're gonna experience as a country is yet to come. And I don't know. Uh, but I guarantee you it's, it's going to come out of people. Anxiety before, anger after. Uh, why? Why is all this happening? Well, if there's one thing we can all agree on, it's that when it comes to politics, we can't all agree on anything. Amen? When it, it comes to politics, man, we can all agree that we can't agree. And that's why it becomes so d divisive and uh, it becomes such an issue. Um, come, come Tuesday night, and, and I gotta say this, come Tuesday night, maybe, maybe sometime Wednesday, maybe sometime next week, maybe next month, maybe next year, I don't know. When it's all settled and the dust clears, there's gonna be two reactions that we're gonna all get to witness. There are gonna be about half the country that are gonna be deliriously happy. They're gonna lose their minds because it was exactly how they had hoped it to turn out. And then there's gonna be uh, another group of people that'll be deeply depressed. Deliriously happy people you don't tend to have to worry too much about, but deeply depressed people can do a lot of harm. They can do harm to themselves and they can do harm to others. And um, deeply depressed people are usually never at their best. Then I think we can all say, yeah, that's right. So let me just say this, politics and faith are such volatile issues that churches tend to do one of two things. And I'm just gonna speak kind of universally. Number one, uh, avoid the issue at all costs. That tends to be one of the, one of the reactions. Just, and, and preachers are you know, basically going, hey man, if I go to sleep and I wake up, maybe it'll be February and all of this will be behind us and it'll have all gone away. Preachers don't like to talk about this. Now, again, I'm not saying all preachers, but it just, it, but, let me explain why, this being a preacher, why it is so hard to talk about politics in church. Because when it comes to the subject, you have to thread the needle so carefully. You have to watch your words so carefully because all you have to do is say something that implied something that made somebody think about something and then their mother said, and then you're guilty of what they said you said. 
See, see, when you talk about politics, here's, somebody's going to feel like, man, a preacher today, he said too much. And others are going to say, you know, he didn't even scratch the surface. He avoided everything. Some, some are going to say, man, he was so partisan about, and the others are going to say he wasn't partisan at all. That was ridiculous. He wouldn't take a stand. Uh, some, some are going to say, you know what? I can't believe he went on and on about that. Why didn't he talk about the other and by the way, you know what matters most to you in this election? That which matters most to you. And if I don't address that which matters most to you, I didn't touch the subject. And so you start to understand how threading the needle becomes so dif- difficult. So one extreme is just say, I'm going to go to sleep and wake up in February and not have to worry about it. The other one, and this is probably the most tragic, and we're watching it happen all around us, is churches decide uh, they're going to take one side or the other. They take sides. And there are churches that are all about the right, and there are churches all about the left. And the problem is, is that when you become a church all about the right, you literally put a sign out in front of your church that says, hey, if you are not all about the right, you are not welcome here. And if you go to the left, you say the same thing. And um, the problem is that um, pretty soon we have changed the mission of our church from helping people to discover Jesus and fully own their faith in him to picking the right side in an election. And churches do that. And you're watching, if you're paying attention, it's happening locally. There are people gravitating to certain churches because they're willing to do that. And what happens is is then the agenda of the church gets kind of taken over by the agenda of the politics. And, and, And so you start to see all kinds of things about, you know, voter registration drives and voter guides. We used to distribute voter guides in our church uh, until we kind of figured out what was actually happening. Let me just say this about voter guides. Nobody, 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 no organization, no individual, nobody puts together a voter guide without an agenda. Voter guides are biased. Voter guides are trying to get you to see something a certain way. And you go, well, there's just an innocent voter guide that was put out by fill in the blank. And then everybody ought to just be okay because it, and then it, all of a sudden, instead of coming to church and talking about what we're gathering here to talk about, which is not politics, we start talking about politics because did you read the voter's guide? Did you know what so-and-so stands for? And all of a sudden we are off track. So we're going to try to avoid all of that. Um, here, here's always been my heart. Okay. And if you've ever wondered, like, why don't we make more? Here's always been my heart. Now, listen carefully, because I'm going to say something very important. I want, when you come here, if you come to Central, I want you to walk in those doors and understand that you didn't enter higher ground. You entered into literally a a higher conversation, which means that whatever political party you belong to and what you support and stand for, would you just leave it at the door because we're going to talk about something far more important. Do you understand what I just said? We're not, we're not saying that's not important. We're not saying that's not important. I'm not saying don't care. I'm saying, no, no, no. When we come here, I, I don't want, and you pick either one. I don't want just Democrats in here. I don't want just Republicans, whichever. And always have to be careful. Which one did you say first? It gets absurd. I want you to be able to sit next to each other and realize, you know what? We disagree on how to solve the problems of this country, but what we don't disagree on is, is the kingdom of God and who's the king of the kingdom. Amen. And, and that, is, that is what matters. So, so just understand kind of what, why it is so difficult. The mission of the church has never been about politics, and I pray it never becomes about politics because we'll lose our focus. Now, perhaps right now you're experiencing one of two emotions. One is fear. Because I I thought this was the one place we could go where we could get away from it all. I mean, goodness, you can't watch a football game without. I thought I could come to church and we not have to think about it. Well, we're going to think about it a little bit. Okay, we're not going to dumb. It's not going to take over our thinking. But we're going to just spend a week or two just kind of put some things in perspective. But but there's a fear because what if he says something that is 100 percent contrary to what I believe? What will we do? And while I would say it shouldn't phase you the least if I disagree with you or you disagree with me, you shouldn't lose any sleep over that. But that's what happens. What if he says something and all of a sudden I don't even want to go back to church because of what he said? Well, first off, you can relax. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. What I'm going to tell you to do is learn to think so that your vote is an intelligently cast ballot. That's what I want you to do. All right. I'm not going to tell you what to vote for. You're bright people. Figure it out. But, but, but some are doing, and other people are going, 
Oh, they don't feel fear. They feel their hope. It's hope. Hope. Oh, man. Oh, good. Good. He's going to get in. I know what he's going to do. I know exactly. I know what he's going to do. He's going to get into that. And you know what? He's going to say it in such a way that my neighbor who, I've tried everything to get through his thick head. Maybe the preacher can get through it. And he's going to say, and then the guy finally going to get it because the preacher said it. Let me, let me explain something to you. Uh, let me tell you what's so tough about this threading the needle. If I say what you want me to say, you have this reaction. You preach, brother. You preach. You, uh, you, amen. Don't let up. Get, get going. Get, amp it up. That's right. And if I say what you didn't want to hear, shut the man up already. What right does he have to speak about that in church? That's exactly what happens. If I say what you want to hear, I can't say enough. If I say what you don't want to hear, shut him up. He said too much. What if there's a better way? Uh, so let, let me explain. Here's the deal. This, this message that I'm preaching right this moment has been on my mind a lot for months. I have thought about this. I have read about this. I have listened. I have researched and I have prayed about this. It's been on my mind a lot. There's a verse, uh, 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 12, verse 32, and I've sh shared this verse before, but it's about the 12 tribes of Israel, and there's one statement said about one tribe, and think of family unit, big family unit, clans, if you would, those would be the tribes. Um, the one group is called uh, the, the family of Issachar. Issachar is the name of a son of Jacob, all right? So Issachar. The sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. You see, these particular people in this family, they were known as, well, these, these folks are wise. These folks are informed. These folks are insightful. And, and therefore, people sought them out for their wisdom. You, you know what my prayer is for us? And you know what my prayer is for me? That I'd be like them, that you'd be like them, that, that I'd be wiser, that you'd be wise, that I'd be informed and that you'd be informed, that I'd be insightful and you'd be insightful. And sometimes the way we get there is we talk. We sit down and we talk. And so that's kind of what the intention is. Now, I, I want to say something before I get to where I'm going. I'm very close. I'm indebted to so many people. And one of the things I never do, I don't ever plagiarize a sermon. You'll never hear me preach somebody else's sermon. I've never done that and I never plan to do that. But on this subject, I've studied so much and I've read so many good things and I've picked out so many. This, when I want to share, I owe a whole bunch of people credit. I just need you to understand that. Now, here's the problem. If I cite every single source of every thought I'm throwing out here, we'll never get you out of here. So just trust me when I tell you people far smarter than me have spoken into this. So I put in a, just a quick list of some people I want to, uh, Andy Stanley, N.T. Wright, Kerry Newhoff, Ed Stetzer, Sharon McMahon, Aaron Brockett, Shane Phillip, Brian Zahn. Those are some of the people that I just feel like I want to credit. And there's a couple of them I'm actually going to call out uh, in, in this message, but I just need you to understand that's what this is. Now, last thing I want to say, last thing before I get to where I want you to see something, I want to say this. I want to say thank you to you. I want to commend you, Central Christian Church. This is not my first electoral rodeo. I have been around this thing a number of times now. I have never seen you carry yourself with as much dignity as you've carried yourself during this electoral process. And I'm saying that extremely sincerely. I've watched people lose their minds in the past. The 2016 election, the 2020 election, people literally lost their minds. And how I know they lost their minds is because they would write to me and they would let me know. And I would just go, you have lost your mind. And uh, they didn't even know where to find it, but it was obviously missing. So anyway, I just commend you. I've gotten a few emails, but they've been minimal. And the problem is, is when I get an email, it's usually somebody wants me to take a stand on something. And what I want to do in this, I'm going to explain to you kind of a different way of doing this. But I think, honestly, most of you have figured this out. I think most of you know who we are as a church. I just commend you for this. Yeah, Ed Stetzer, uh, in a message, uh, he said this. He said, in 2016 and 2020, the church went through what he dubbed the great sorting. The great sorting is, is where uh, people go, you know what? I can't believe my preacher didn't say, and I can't believe we didn't. And, and so people say, I'm not going to church there anymore. And they left. And, and then other people got wind that there's a church down the road that stands for this. Like, like we stand for love beyond. What does that mean? It means we're not going to put all these barriers to loving people. We, we believe that Jesus wants you to go out as, as far as you feel comfortable 
in interacting with people and then go further. That's what love beyond means. It means you don't put a wall up, you don't put a moat up, you don't put a, dig a moat, you don't put a fence, you don't, you don't, you don't put barriers. You don't, I'll go as far as I feel comfortable. I'll feel as far as I feel safe. I'll go as far as I, we just don't do that. We're just going, hey, you know what? We're just going to love people. And sometimes it gets uncomfortable and sometimes it gets, uh, it doesn't mean everything goes. We don't stand for that. But what we do is we're going to say every human being has dignity and every human being deserves uh, attention and everyone is worthy of a relationship with God. We stand for that. And so people uh, don't want that. They don't want a church like that. They don't come here. But look around, folks. There's a lot of people who go, that's exactly the kind of church I want to go to. So we kind of know who we are now. So I commend you. I commend you because this is the kind of church and we will talk politics a little tiny bit. We give it no more attention than it deserves in the big picture, but that's who we are. All right. So let me just say this. Let me get, let's get going here. All right. Now, how, how important do you think this election is? Now, this is where you've got to be honest with yourself. I'm not going to ask you to say anything out loud. You're not going to have to put on record anything, but how important is, so let me just fire off some questions to get you thinking. Do you believe that Jesus is for one political party or the other? Now, don't say anything out loud. Just think. Do you believe that Jesus is on one side and not on the other side? That's an important question. Here's a second important question. Do you believe that the power and glory of Jesus is going to be adversely affected by who wins and who loses next Tuesday? Is Jesus the least bit nervous about this election? Third question. Do you believe the kingdom of God is ultimately dependent upon the outcomes of any political contest on earth. And the fourth question gets really personal. Do you believe our country is going to go off the rails if the person you didn't vote for president becomes our president? There's the old expression, I said off the rails. The old expression, hell in a handbasket, is going to go to hell in a handbasket if so and so gets in the office. And I'll tell you what, if you watch any political ad, which, by the way, do you know the political ads on TV are not regulated, that they can say whatever they want to say? It doesn't have to be factual. Did you know that? But if you paid any attention to any of the ads on either party, you would think, man, we're seriously, the world's going to come to an end. Do you really believe that? And if so, can you spend the next few minutes just thinking more deeply about this with me? It seems kind of silly when you stop to think, that the elected office of president is a four-year term, eight at most nowadays, eight at most. And yet we are so quick to fear the absolute worst that's going to happen over the... So let's get down to it. I want to explain Jesus and politics with you as quickly and as well as I know how. I want to explain a couple of things. First thing I want to explain to you is the world in which Jesus walked was extremely political, extremely political. They didn't have two parties that couldn't stand each other. They had numerous parties. Let me just give you a couple of the realities that were very much uh, a part of the life in, in, uh, of the day of Jesus. Number one, there was an oppressing power, a controlling power called Rome. So Jesus is in Israel. Israel is under the, the dominance of the Roman Empire, which you learned all about this in school. The mighty Roman Empire was in charge. And they had their own king. They called him Caesar. And, and, and what they wanted, they wanted to tax us from the people. That was about expanding their kingdom. So you have to watch out for the Romans. And then there was a group of Jewish people that were literally committed to overthrowing the Romans. They were called the Zealots. It was a party of people who were basically going, we're not going to cooperate. We're going to subvert at every move. We're going to undermine. We're going to, we're going to see the Romans out. And, that was, and then there was another group called the Herodians. The Herodians were devotees of Herod the Great. Herod was a sub-king, as it were. Uh, he was the guy that was directly over, it, it, Rome was a big power, Herod was the Roman that ruled the land. And there were people that were deeply devoted to him. Then there was a group called the Sadducees. 
The Sadducees had a certain, they were the Jewish elite. They had a certain way of interpreting scripture. They were all about the temple. Then there was another Jewish group called the Pharisees. The Pharisees were all about the legal, all about what the law said and what the Bible and the Torah, and they studied it. So here's what you need to understand. For Jesus to live his life and walk on this earth, he had to tiptoe around all of these political parties. You think you walk through landmines? Imagine being Jesus trying to call people to something bigger than any of these realms. That's what Jesus was up against. So yeah, it might be tough on your job, and it might be tough in your neighborhood, it might be tough at your school, it might be tough, but guess what? There's only two, for the, for the most part, in our country. But I just named five, and that was not the entire list. That's just, it was everywhere. That's the first thing I want you to know. Second thing I want you to know is that Jesus never really seemed too interested or concerned about politics. I need you to just read your Bible on this one. He just didn't. Let me, let me give you a simple example, all right? I'm going to take you to Mark chapter 12. Now, normally I have you open your Bible because I'm trying to move through a lot of material fast. I'm just going to read this to you. Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. It says this. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees, that's one of the political groups, some of the Herodians, that was another one, remember, to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and they said, oh, you want to talk about kissing up. Okay, let me... Just this is what kissing up looks like. Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Oh my goodness. Is it right to pay the imperial, imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? Now you got to understand that is a trap. You got to understand that these parties are now pitting Jesus against the, however he answers this w w someone's going to go ha ha therefore and it is a setup and they're tr trying to make a puppet out of Jesus here they're trying to make a pawn but Jesus knew their hypocrisy why are you trying to trap me he said uh, bring me a denarius the coin and let me look at it they brought a coin and he asked them, whose image is on this? And whose inscription? Well, Caesar's, that's Rome, they imply, they reply. Then Jesus said to them, well, here, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed. He diffused the track. In, in other words, he, what he's, he basically saying, hey, look, if it belongs to Caesar, give it to Caesar. If it belongs to God, give it to God. What he was implying, don't you ever give to Caesar what belongs to God. That's what he was saying. Don't you ever give to Caesar what belongs to God. What belongs to God, but not Caesar. Don't miss it. You. Your heart. Your allegiance. Don't ever give to the state what first belongs to God. Now, the big idea, our allegiance to Christ should supersede every other allegiance we have. Let me, let me explain. It's always gonna be a, a, it's always gonna be a battle of power. Who, who, who comes first, your political platform or your faith? It, it, it sounds easy, but it's, Jesus going, look, I don't have any problem with Caesar. Caesar, Caesar, but God is God. And by the way, do you know that in Jesus' most famous sermon, his most famous sermon, the one that we spent all summer talking about, this most famous, the most famous sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, do you know that he never once in the entire sermon addressed anything political? Everyone there was under the power of Rome. He didn't even mention it. Is that it does not matter. And by the way, no one under there today is under the power of Rome. But it was so important. No, it's temporary. The kingdom, that's continued to expand. So um, to think about it, all right? Here's the, here's the third thing I want to tell you about Jesus in politics. Jesus didn't feel the need to reveal his thoughts or insights to everyone. Do you ever think about this? This is what I find also fascinating. People want me to weigh in on things. Where do you stand? Who are you voting for? You know what? Like, am I obligated to tell you that? 
I mean, is that somehow like mandatory that I reveal that to you? You know, it's interesting because Jesus, if you study the life of Jesus, you know what you'll find in Jesus? You'll find this little phenomenon. Many, many times when he was asked a question, he did one of two things. He ignored the question or he answered the question with a question. In other words, you know, it's like in Princess Bride, who are you? You know, well, prepare to be disappointed because I'm not going to tell you. That's, the, he's not going to tell you. He just, where, where he, it doesn't matter. He could hold things in and people got frustrated. Do you, do you remember in that scene in the Last Supper? Do you remember he washed their feet and then he, they were around the table and Jesus made this statement. He says, one of you is going to betray me. Remember that? It's famous. One of you is, he's talking about Judas. Judas is going to sell him out. And, and Judas has arranged for him to be taken, okay? And, and he goes, one of you is going to be, you remember the reaction of the other apostles? Do you remember the reaction? They're all going, is, is, it, is, is it me? Is it, is it I? Am I, going to do, am I going to betray you? Do you understand what just happened? He just washed the feet of all those guys. He just had a meal with all those guys. And he says, one of you, and they did not have a clue. Why? Because Jesus didn't make all the slots known. He didn't treat Judas bad that evening. He was in a bad mood because Jesus couldn't betray him. He, he just treated him like he treated him. And everyone else didn't have a clue. He knew exactly what Judas was going to do. And until it was time to tell, he didn't tell. So let's, you know, people don't owe you an answer to, to the questions that they want to pry into. They just, you just don't, Jesus didn't, you know. Here's, here's a fourth thing I want you to understand about Jesus. Jesus was crystal clear on his mission, crystal clear. And after they got him and they were about to execute him, you might remember this scene from John 18. Then Pilate went back into his headquarters and he called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked him. And Jesus replied, is this your own question? Or did others tell you about me? He answered a question with a question. Is this your own? Or did, where's the root of that question coming from, Pilate? It's Jesus, I'm telling you. Um, Am I a Jew? Pilate retorted. Your own people and, and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. This is what you need to understand. Jesus is saying, look, I'm not going to be used as a puppet for any political party or platform. I'm not going there. It's not what I care about. Now, we can try to make him care about all those things, but I'm just telling you, if you want to know the biblical Jesus, he didn't care. He came to build his own kingdom. Now, hold that in the back of your head for just a moment. It's a question of priorities. Which, which is going to matter to you? Which, let, let's just get real. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. You answer these in your heart of hearts as honestly as you can, because it'll tell you a ton about what's going on inside of you. Which matters to you more, your faith or your politics? Here's how, here's how you could know. If you had to get rid of one and could only hold on to one, which would you hold on to, faith or politics? Now, let me put this another way. When you read your Bible, do you read your Bible through the lens of your politics to understand your politics better? Or do you read the Bible so that you can understand the Bible better and understand the part politics plays if it does it all. It's a very relevant dilemma. Aaron Brockett put it this way. And again, this is just worth pondering. These are deep thoughts. Am I more comfortable with people who love Jesus but see things differently politically or with people who don't love Jesus but have the same political viewpoint as I do? That's a deep well. So, what are we going to do? What do I suggest you do? As pastor, what would I... I mean, you see, again, I, I, I want to... 
I, 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 I want to give insight, but I don't want to give insult. I, I want to just kind of help you. That, okay, what do we do? So let me just suggest some things you might want to consider. Put your faith in Jesus first and foremost. Put your faith in Jesus first and foremost. I, 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 I'm kind of excited to tell you this. The kingdom of heaven is not holding elections this year. <laughs> Jesus is not up for re-election. So, woo! Woo! Yeah, his seat is secure. Yay! Another four years. Okay, let me explain something. Why, why does this matter? Um, and I'm going to say this is going to be sharp. Hear me. Jesus does not need the help of any other savior to accomplish what he's trying to accomplish. He, he, he doesn't need another help, a savior's help to save you, to save me, to save us, to save his church, to save the country, to save the world. He didn't need any person's help. His position is secure. For 2,000 years, he sat on that throne, Jesus. Take comfort in that. Second thing I want you to know, I'm just going to tell you, don't hesitate to vote. Don't hesitate to vote. When the uh, uh, Babylonians captured the Israelites, took them off to Babylon, Jeremiah the prophet said this, God spoke through Jeremiah, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. I am in exile here. I, my citizenship is in heaven. I am passing through. This is not my home. This is not permanent. This is, I'm visiting this, as are you, if you are part of the kingdom of God. This is temporary. Pray, pray for this place, because you live here. But don't give it your ultimate allegiance. But pray for it. And, and when you vote, what you're doing is, and I want to say, we're always talking about voters' rights. Let me suggest something. Voting is a privilege, not a right. If it were a right, all throughout history, people would have had the right to vote. Very few people in history ever had a say over how they were going to live in, in the society in which they were born into. The idea of democracy, this is not this long-lived that you get a vote is a privilege and exercise your privilege if you want to. I'm gonna say something very provocative right now, ready? If you don't wanna vote, not a sin not to vote. What? <laughs> it's not a, if you don't wanna vote, don't vote. There's 11 commandments. The 11th one is thou shalt vote every time. No, Jesus never voted. He never voted ever. So my point is, you have a privilege to vote. Use it. But if for whatever reason you go, I'm sitting this one out, God is not going, well, that's going to cost you eternity. <laughs> yeah, should have thought that one through. And most preachers won't tell you that, but I only got five and a half months, so what the heck. <laughs> Here we go. So you're going to vote. Vote if you want to, but let your faith inform your vote. Let your faith inform your vote. Don't be naive. Listen, listen to me. Listen to me. Politicians are interested, Christian, in your vote far more than they're interested in your values. They want your vote. They don't want your values. You must be deep enough in your thinking to use your values to guide your vote, not the will of a politician to get your vote. Let your values dictate. So go through the different issues and decide which politician most represents what I believe. Now, here, now I'm going to say something else. Listen carefully. Because you go, well, what would make me happiest? Can I suggest if your allegiance is to a higher source? The question is not what would make me happier. It would be what would Jesus want me to do with my vote? Which would best build the kingdom of heaven? I would just suggest vote that way. Go through each issue, each policy, and go each, yeah, just what would the kingdom, how would the kingdom benefit most? Let that guide you. Um, let me keep going here. Fourth, uh, don't put politics over people. Andy Stanley said this so well. I, I wish you could just hear what he said. But basically what he said was this, is that in the church, in, the ch in this place, we can disagree politically. You might think the best way to get the country to move forward would be that. I don't. I think that. Fine. Culturally, we can disagree we can disagree theologically. We can do all that, but we cannot 
refuse to love each other unconditionally. And this is what breaks up churches. If your allegiance is more to that issue or the politic than it is the kingdom, that politic can destroy what we have in sharing the kingdom. And uh, between services just now, a gentleman came up to me and he said, he said, I'll tell you what, any, I'm, uh, how he said it, if anyone is going to leave the church over what you just said, they put their political hat on over their kingdom hat. Don't ever put politics over people. And then this is the last one. I'll close on this. Understand the power of powerlessness. What? Everything in politics is all about power. If we have the power, if we, have the, if we could just get the seat, we could have the power. And uh, we get so wrapped up in power. There was a book written by a guy named Larry Hurtado. Uh, this is the book. It's going to show it up here. It's called Destroyer of the Gods. And if you could read the subtitle, Early Christians, Distinctiveness in the Roman World. This is a book in which this author basically says, if you want to understand history, you got to realize what overthrew the Roman Empire was the Christian church. And uh, as he goes through this book, he identifies five things that the early church did that the Roman world literally got knocked into the ropes. They got on their heels. They had never seen it before and they didn't know what to do with it. And he referenced a scripture for every one of these for the sake of time. I can't do all that. Let me just give you the five things. He says these five values that the church possessed literally dismantled the entire empire of Rome. First issue, I know you use each of these in one word. They're bigger issues. And again, there's scripture behind all of this diversity. The early church valued diversity. What does that mean? It means they basically said, they took Romans 5, 9, that in heaven there's going to be every tongue, tribe, language, you know, uh, we're all going to be in heaven. All different colors are going to be in heaven. And basically the church said, hey, if we're all going to be in heaven in the end, why don't we just practice now? We'll learn how to get along. We'll be ready. And the Roman world went, what? The Roman world was all about the Roman world and like being with like. And all of a sudden the church comes along and says, no, we're not like that. We value all kinds of people. The second thing had to do with sex. You see, in the Roman world, people did whatever they felt like they wanted to do. Anything goes, it doesn't matter. You know, we'll just have sex however we want to have it. Kind of like our, and the Christians came along and said, you know what? Sex is not a biological thing only. There's a spiritual dimension. And if you read Ephesians chapter five, it talks about the marriage relationship and how it's like the church and the whole idea that a man and a woman for life and all of this. And, and the, the Roman world went, what? Knocked them on their heels. The third thing that the value of the early church was justice. The early church jumped in and when they saw an injustice, they basically did what they could. They got to understand, they didn't have a democracy, they didn't have a vote, they didn't have a voice. They just had the ability to value something and justice mattered. If somebody was being marginalized, if somebody was being ostracized, if somebody was being hurt, they stood up for them. The fourth one had to do with life. You see, in the Roman world, if uh, life was very cheap, and especially if you were not Roman, and, and if you were like, they would take babies and they would literally throw the babies out. They leave them out to be exposed to the elements until they died, particularly young girls, baby girls. And the church came along and said, that life is sacred. That life is special. And the church said, we're going to take your babies and we're going to take them in and we're going to raise them. We're going to take care of them. And the church did. And they took care of the women who had abandoned their babies because their husband made them. And the Roman world went, what, who does that? The fifth thing he identifies is the early church was all about peacekeeping, peacemaking. Peacemaking means you get in there and you do the hard work to bring sides together. Now you wanna know, like, know why in America our political system is so difficult to understand, so hard to navigate? Because if you take those five values, those are values from God, not from any political platform. But what are the political platforms done with those five things? Is there one platform of the two that's taken more of an issue on diversity than the other? Well, if you know anything, you know that, uh, yeah, we're going to have to say the Democrat Party has more of that. Uh, how about sex? Which, which one has, you know, kind of made sex the, the issue in terms of like, from God's perspective, well, if you're going to be honest, you'd have to say, and again, I'm, don't get mad at me, just, you'd have to say, well, the Republican Party gets that one. How about, how about justice? 
Well, for the most part, we've got to give that to the Democrats. How about uh, sanctity of life? Well, come on. If you're going to be truthful, you're going to say I'd give that more to the Republicans. What about peacemaking? Peacekeeping? You can't give that to either party. So we got 50-50 here. So what is a church supposed to do? Let me explain. Here's the problem. I got my Bible here, and I want to understand. God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to vote? And so, God, I'm just going to... I'm just, God, I just want you to show me clearly... Show me what you want, God. Okay, okay, oh yeah, I see it, God, I see it, okay. And I interpret everything I read in the Bible through my blue glasses so I can say, this is what God wants. Some of you are going, that's ridiculous, I would never do that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now it's crystal clear. <laughs> this was not intentional, but can I just point something out? Red letters with red glasses are really hard to read. That was free, that was free. But now I see, okay, now it all makes sense. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you believe Jesus is for one political platform or the other? Or do you think truth might have a little bit of both? Well, that's interesting. That looks different. Can I suggest that no political party has the corner on God? or God's truth, but different parties have different, like they're closer, maybe not on, but closer. How about if you didn't read with a red, how about if you just said, you know what, God, I don't want any political platform to influence what I think of you, and I wanna just see you for who you are, and you just read scripture and let it speak to you and forgot the red and forgot the blue, and then saw it this way. We're going to close this service with a time of communion, a time of reflection, a time that I would hope that we would just be able to sit here together, realize, you know what, you don't have to, you don't have to vote the way I vote, and you're not an idiot if you vote differently than I do. And nor am I an idiot if I don't vote the way you vote. But none of that really matters because we checked all that at the door because we came in to honor a higher allegiance of which we both share and we're not going to let that stuff ruin the sweetness of what we have. So I want you to understand that when Jesus went to the cross, and that's what we are remembering, being grateful for when we take communion together, is that whether you prefer the red or the blue, whether you are more of this than that, you understand that every person in this room and every person out there was a child that God died for and he wants nothing but the very best for them. And all the dividing and all the separating and all the polarizing and all the hate and all the, is not what he came for. If your first allegiance is to the kingdom of God, focus on the kingdom of God. If we get this one right, none of the rest is gonna matter. So when you take communion in the next few moments, do so realizing that Jesus went to great lengths to include you and it had nothing to do with how you vote. He loves you. There's three words I'm gonna put up on the screen and I'm gonna give you two minutes to take communion and pray through these three words and uh, pray for us as a country. Again, half the country is gonna be deliriously happy, half is gonna be seriously depressed. Who knows what's coming? How about we pray for unity? and peace and love. Those three things, if they would prevail, some incredible things could happen. So I'm gonna pray, then I'm gonna stop talking, give you a couple minutes, and then I'll close out the service. So Father, thank you for the time. Thanks for the truth. God, we're, uh, it's a touchy time. We're, we're a lot of anger, a lot of anxiety. God, bring us to our senses. Keep us sane in this time. Father, help us to realize that really none of that ultimately is gonna matter. Rome is gone. The Herodians no longer exist. Pharisees, Sadducees, gone. Zealots, gone. And one day these political parties will no longer exist. But your kingdom will go on. Give us focus, Father, what really matters.
these moments, we pray. I want you, if you would, to just imagine if we claim that our allegiance is higher and we appreciate all the privileges the country that we live in has brought us, but our allegiance is not ultimately to this country, it's to the kingdom. I want to just have you dream with me for a moment. What if we lived as if that were true? Not we just said it was true, not we said we believed it was true, but that we lived it out that we refuse to hate people, that we refuse to join in the rancorous arguments, that we, we just were not gonna participate in the Thanksgiving brawl that's divided so many families, that we weren't gonna let this thing get so out of whack that we write off our own kids or our own parents. What if we were truly different? Light in the darkness. Could you even begin to imagine the difference we could make. Folks, again, I, I don't have a long term left to be the lead pastor of this church, but I am telling you, I believe with all of my heart, we are in the most unique moment to make a difference in the culture in which we live that we've been in my entire life. If the church would simply be the church, the world would get knocked on its heels. It's our moment to shine, and I encourage you, shine, shine, shine. So I'm going to end this message where I started by saying thank you for being here. Thanks for wherever you are. Thanks for being a part of this church. Thank you for keeping your minds where they belong. And uh, hey, don't miss next week. <laughs> Who knows? I guarantee you, though, we'll be here next week. You come, we'll talk about it. God bless you. you want to pray with somebody, come on down front here and there'll be people to pray with. Thanks for being here. Bye-bye.